This is Jeffrey Rickman, and this is my show, Plain Spoken. I've done a, a variety of different things, and I've been glad to, to be able to do a variety of different things. Uh, sometimes I do interviews, and most recently it's been uh, with a gentleman at Asbury uh, Seminary and School with the Revival, and I've been really happy to, to be able to help people see what's going on there. Um, today I'm doing a different kind of interview, and this is not my strong suit. This is going to be um, stuff dealing with the United Methodist Church disciplinary protocol stuff. And the reason it matters is because um, we're in a period right now where um, leadership is trying to make the case that they have been faithful in, in upholding their covenant uh, duties and responsibilities. And uh, I and many people, like my guests today, are um, we want to believe that that is the case, but we see a number of things that concern us. And so rather than pretending that they aren't there, uh, we want to shine a light in a dark place right now and um, hopefully lead to uh, more honest and earnest discussion in the United Methodist Church as we're discerning how to navigate um, things that have been tearing us apart for a long time. So um, on the front end, even though what I'm doing could be conceived as stirring the pot or um, trying to cause some drama, it's up to you whether or not you believe me. It's not my intention to do that. Rather, I think that um, God is glorified when we speak the truth in love and when we are uh, looking at those things that are hard to look at. I think that's what uh, Christ's Holy Spirit gives us the strength and commission to do. I think this is one of the ways in which Christians live differently in the world. So um, uh, just as a brief introduction, um, well, Robert Barnes, let's just go ahead and say thank you for, for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. It's good to be here. Great. He's an ordained elder in the Baltimore-Washington Conference. That's right, right? Correct. Very good. And um, we're talking today about Bishop Karen Olivetto, who, of course, has been a lightning rod of controversy ever since she came on the scene for most United Methodists in 2016. She was uh, elected as our first openly gay, uh, in her case, lesbian um, bishop. Now, uh, pretty Soon after she was elected, there were a number of people who cried foul because of our disciplinary language against um, self-avowed practicing homosexuals being in any form of ordained ministry. Uh, she, attaining the highest office, uh, didn't seem to uh, comport with disciplinary provisions. So the Judicial Council got involved, and they actually pronounced that she was illegitimately placed in that office, that she was not serving um, in, in accordance with the discipline but then what they did was they put it in the College of Bishops in her area to remove her, and they elected not to do so. So this is one of um, at least a dozen things that most conservatives can point to as being uh, just clear signs that the Book of Discipline is not being upheld and maintained, which is, of course, the job of bishops to do. <clears throat> Paragraph 413 in the Book of Discipline. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just to kind of set the stage for what uh, Reverend Barnes did, we're going to call him Bob from now on, what he did um, was he engaged in this, this process that's outlined in paragraph 413 in the Book of Discipline, and here's what it says. This is, this is for complaints against bishops. Episcopal leadership in the United Methodist Church shares with all other ordained persons in the sacred trust of their ordination. The ministry of bishops as set forth in the Book of Discipline also flows from the gospel as taught by Jesus the Christ and proclaimed by his apostles. Whenever a bishop violates this trust or is unable to fulfill appropriate responsibilities, continuation in the Episcopal office shall be subject to review. This review shall have its primary purpose, uh, as its primary purpose, a just resolution of any violations of this sacred trust in the hope that God's work of justice, reconciliation, and healing may be realized. So um, all that to say, there once someone has been put in that office, they are subject to review and potentially to be removed from that office if a just resolution um, is not reached. So the, the particular issue that Reverend Barnes um, spoke to a, a few years ago and is now going to update us on is aside from the Judicial Council decision, aside from the legality of her taking office, it actually has to do with the content of the doctrine of what um, Mrs. Oliveto has has preached and taught. Um, and so uh, how about, Bob, we turn to you at this point, and you give us just a, an opening outline of, of what uh, transpired 
And uh, what was the reason and the basis for your complaint? Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, I would say this. I became aware, as did other people in our conference, even halfway around the country, of the of an unsettling blog which Bishop Olivito had, had published. Um, it was a reflection on Matthew 15, verses 21 to 28, a, a conversation that Jesus had with a, a Canaanite or a, a, a Syrophoenician woman in which Jesus and his disciples are are traveling through Gentile territory, which, by the way, is a sign that Jesus, at least, is not closed to interacting with people who are not Jews. And in fact, if you read the entire Gospel of Matthew, whether someone believes it's the true Word of God, as I do, or just a collection of teachings and made-up stories, Matthew is consistent throughout in portraying Jesus as one who's breaking down barriers between people and, and offering salvation or healing to everyone. Well, it's the end of the day, and maybe everyone is tired, but this woman, this Canaanite woman, comes and asks to see Jesus. She says her, her daughter is suffering because she is possessed by a demon. And, and let me read to you what happens next from the gospel, because I, I think this is the most relevant part. It's about who we believe and who we, be, who we believe Jesus is. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew 15, 23 says, Jesus did not answer a word when the woman was asking for help. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, Jesus did, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. But the woman came and knelt before him, and she said, Lord, help me. And Jesus replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Now, I get it that some people scratch their head and wonder why Jesus initially answered the woman the way that he did at first, only to then turn around so easily and, and, and bless her faith and heal her daughter. Now, the traditional view is that Jesus was in some way either testing the woman's faith by challenging it, he was bringing out the level of her faith, or and using this conversation as a teaching moment with his disciples who were behind him on the learning curve. But Bishop Olivero wrote, and uh, can I read this, Jeffrey? Please. Okay, this is from her blog, if I have it correctly. Um, Too many folks want to box Jesus in, carve him in stone, create an idol out of him. Interesting phrase to be unpacked. But she continues, this story cracks the pedestal we've put him on. The wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting one, prince of peace, was as human as you and me. Like you and me, he didn't have his life figured out. He was still growing, maturing, putting the pieces together about who he was and what he was supposed to do. We might think of him as the rock of ages, but he was more like a hunk of clay, forming and reforming himself in relation to God. As one person put it, Jesus wasn't a know-it-all. He was also learning God's will like any human being, and finally he changed his mind. And then we have these words, if Jesus didn't have to know it all innately, but rather could grow into new and deeper understanding through an openness to God's people, even those he formerly discounted, maybe if Jesus could change his mind, then maybe so can we. And I, I think you might get there the, um, the, 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 the subtext of what Bishop Olivido is writing. Well, anyway, she continues, as he encountered this one who was a stranger, he comes to a fuller sense of the people he is to be in relationship with. He is meant to be a boundary crosser, and in the crossing over reveals bigotry and oppression for what they are. Human constructs that keep all of us from being whole. He learns that no one, no one including the outsider, the foreigner, the hated, the misunderstood, the feared, no one is outside of the heart of God and the care of God. In his conversion. Alavito is writing about Jesus being converted. By changing his mind and acting outside of tradition, by treating the woman as a, a person and responding to her needs, Jesus is willing to stand against culture and social norms and risk his status and power. It is this action of giving up that Jesus gains the most. 
because of his willingness to be in relationship with one so different, Jesus finds greater intimacy with God. The two go hand in hand. This is the heart of the story. This is what offers us hope. If Jesus can change, if he can give up his bigotries and prejudices, if he can realize that he had made his life too small, and if in this realization he grew closer to others and closer to God, then so can we. So let me ask you, Jeffrey, what do you um, make of that? Yeah, I don't want to step on your toes. And of course, I've read the actual complaint um, that you uh, submitted, and I saw this text. I remember uh, there was reporting on this when you submitted this complaint. And, um, you know, I, reviewing it again, you know, I, I uh, highlighted uh, some things that are problematic for me, uh, the notion that Jesus could change his mind, that he uh, uh, was a, a bigot and, or an oppressor, um, that uh, he gave up his bigotries and prejudices, that he... The, the ones that I, I saw you really elucidated later, to create an idol out of him uh, seems to just automatically betray a rejection of Trinitarian theology. You, the second per- person of the Trinity cannot be an idol, because an idol is, is something that takes our affections that belong to God. Well, he is God. So if you call him an idol, <laughs> you're, you're saying he's not God. I mean, just definitionally. But also, um, when we say that he's as human as you and me— in the context, it's very clear she means something very different um, from what ancient early believers meant when they said that. Um, and then whenever it talks about him being converted, um, there just seems to be a fundamental dis- uh, denial of the, eter- the eternal logos, uh, which, you know, in the Gospel of John, we're told that he is the logos, uh, made flesh, he is not a created beating- being. And so as I remember reading that the first time, and then the impression just seems uh, abundantly clear now, that her, her Christology is not uh, recognizably orthodox, but would be more akin to, um, I mean, I think of Arianism, except um, I always kind of equate Arius with um, the, the, the Doketics or the, the Gnostics in some sense, and what she's really doing, as I've understood it, is this, this thing that's very normal and natural that people of all persuasions do, we try and fit Jesus into our ideological box that we already have, you know, so the thing that she's trying to facilitate, as I understand it, is the modern social justice warrior. Jesus is the modern social justice warrior, and whenever he accepts his role as a a power holder, you know, he was a male in a a patriarchal society, his job, as is the job of people like me and you now, is to um, deface ourself to some degree, or efface ourself in some degree, and show solidarity with those who are... um, oppressed and to get over our own bigotries and our way of seeing things and then appeal to the wisdom of, of people who, who uh, in a biblical sense, are, are superior to us because um, they're, they're on the lower end of the intersectional uh, uh, totem pole. Um, so I, I just see her really superimposing her own value system onto Jesus <clears throat> and then um, divorcing this particular pericope from what came before and what comes afterwards, as well as historic Orthodox Christian theology. So I think you were right, personally, um, to pick on this. I, I didn't realize that it was in a, a blog. I thought she actually delivered this as a sermon, but this is just something that she wrote, had I been mistaken? Yes, uh, she wrote a blog, and it was uh, taken down, but people copied it before she took it down. Yeah. I think she got word that this was controversial. Okay, so she did take it down. Okay. So it's one of those things where it's it's clear clearly evident that she crossed a line. She got called on it. And so, um, well, before we go further, the way that I digested this, do you think that I, I made stuff up, or do you think that my initial reaction coheres with reality? I I, I think it, it I, I basically think you're cohering with reality. Okay. Um, there were points where I was wondering exactly what she meant, because, you know, I I saw this. The Bible says that Jesus was God come in the flesh. And so from the earliest times, almost, the the church wrestled with how to explain he's fully God and fully man, and what do we make of this? And he didn't know everything. This is staggering. Like, for instance, he said only the Father knows when the end of the age would be. He admitted that. And and granted, in becoming one of us, he he had to grow and, and learn in some ways, if only physically. But 
But we believe God's essential nature was always found in him from the time he was a boy and before. Remember, he was a boy and he, right. he stayed behind to discuss the word with the Jewish teachers. He reflected God's nature and he he was sinless. And so I get where like very orthodox, very serious Christians can wonder exactly how that played out. But when Bishop Olavito portrays him as not only in some way growing in a necessary way, if God became one of us, certainly he grew in Mary's womb. I mean, sure. it's hard to put it in the word, but he 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 he's not innately superior to us. He he's actually so flawed and so sinful that un, until this Canaanite woman stands up to him, Jesus could be a Jewish Archie Bunker. Well, this is different from what the United Methodist Church teaches on a most foundational level. And so I brought her up on, on charges of dissemination of doctrines contrary to the established standards of doctrine of the United Methodist Church, paragraph 2702.1e. And, and to me, there was a another bishop. You remember a Bishop Sprague, I believe it was? Yeah, you're going to talk about in 2004, whenever he publicly oh, denied um, the virgin birth, the bodily resurrection, a number of supernatural things that are uh, uh, built into the Christian faith. Um, and the way I recall, you know, I, I wasn't paying attention back then very much, but the way I recall it was they, they filed charges. Charges were filed against him, uh, very uh, probably the exact same charges that you're filing against Bishop Oliveto, and those charges were eventually just dropped um, I don't remember the procedural moves that they did, but even though he was, they had him dead to rights, uh, they just refused to uh, have him be exposed to church discipline. And, and to me, I, I don't know, but in some ways, this would be if, if I, can I imagine writing either thing? Um, I, I believe, I believe the gospel. I believe the, the gospel is proclaimed in our discipline, though I'm sure our theology we only know in part. But I, I could imagine a person doubting the resurrection, but really wanting to believe it. I mean, I think there was someone in the Bible who did that. They weren't a bishop. They were an, a, an apostle eventually. Remember Thomas. So, I, you know, what's the hymn, in, hymn of promise? In our doubt, there is believing. I get how such doubt could be inside of a bishop, but it, you wouldn't want to teach it. That would be not being a bishop. But here's Bishop Olivito. And she is portraying not only doubts about, is it all true? This is the good news, and I want to believe it so bad, but I doubt. But she's portraying Jesus as being sinful in a way that, that not only contradicts Methodist teaching and Christian teaching, but the, the entire arc of, of Matthew's gospel, which she is, is supposedly commenting on. I mean, there's almost something cynical about that to me. I could be wrong. Dude, that's a good word. Yeah, cynical. Yeah. So, but so let me let me anticipate people whose eyes are glazing over because we're talking about theology, and that's not the the love language of a lot of people. Yeah. A lot of people, once you start talking this level of theology, they just start going, "Why do you guys even care?" She's a she's calling herself a Christian. She's preaching about Jesus. Isn't she lifting up his? His name, you know, isn't that the 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 job of a bishop? And you and I would, I, I think, both roundly say, no, it, it's more particular than that. You know, we were talking uh, privately before this. I was remembering that our our new bishop, Kenitha, Kennetha Bingham Tsai, I don't know how you say her first name, when she was questioned before being elected as a bishop, uh, she was asked about her Christology, and she said flat out she doesn't think it matters what people believe about Jesus, how they articulate their theology about him. But if we don't have a concern for Orthodox Christology, right belief about Christ Jesus, you start getting to places like this where, okay, why are we serving and worshiping this guy? Why are we bearing his name? Why would we bury, uh, carry the name, bear the name of a, a guy who was a, a bigot, you know? Or, you know, once we get too far in this intersectional thing, it becomes very problematic that God came as a man, um, a, a smart uh, uh, capable, powerful man in, by worldly standards. You know, the, it, it, it problematizes foundational building blocks of the faith that undo how it works. So what is Jesus without his uh, perfect divinity? What, what kind of Christ are we serving? You know, whenever the scriptures say God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Well, when we're talking about God growing and developing, not just physically in a body form, that's not a problem, but to grow morally. 
you know, or as though Jesus did not know from the beginning that his mission was to open um, God's family to the Gentiles. Oh, that was just a mystery to me until this Syrophoenician woman came up. To imagine that Jesus was that ignorant of the eternal plan that Paul himself knew. You know, he talked about the eternal mystery that, that, that the kingdom would be open to the Gentiles. To imagine that Jesus would be more ignorant than Paul and foundationally misunderstand how to treat people made in God's image, that really is scandalous. That really is like, um, I would say that's an insult to 2,000 years of mature Christian theology and replacing that with a, a, a pugnacious, um, immature, short-sighted uh, vision of what the Christian uh, religion is here to do. So I think it's foundationally problematic. I don't think you were splitting hairs here, and I, I, I think she was right to take it down. I think she would have been more right never to write it in the first place or believe it. You know, we don't need bishops to give us doubt or even permit doubt. We need bishops to show us faith, life-saving faith, and that's the the thing that is on her shoulders if she takes the mantle of a bishop, and instead what we see is um, her dismantling Christology and Christian sexual ethics. Like, she is uh, an overt Trojan horse to destroy any semblance of biblically recognizable Christianity. So, now that I said the dramatic things, um, let's. can we do a timeline next? Would that be in order? Sure. Okay, um, go ahead. And I had to go back and look at my notes, so I'm trusting all of this in my reading of my notes. But on um, I discussed bringing this up on charges before. I had seen a, a church in West Virginia that um, ultimately got into a terrible situation in the Baltimore Washington Conference, Oakland United Methodist Church, and the defining issue that drove them from any loyalty to Method United Methodism at all was actually this teaching. They said it wasn't her being a lesbian; it was her denying Christ, seemingly. So on September 28, 2018, I mailed out the complaint I made to um, by certified mail to Bishop Robert Hoshibata of the Desert Southwest Conference, if I'm saying that right, and um, the president of the Western Jurisdiction College of Bishops. I also emailed Bishop Kenneth Carter of the Florida Conference, who was then the president of the Global Council of Bishops, if I'm saying that right. And by early October, I was getting a response from Bishop Hoshibata, and we discussed how the, the process would proceed. Uh, Bishop Hoshibata was, Hashibata was really concerned about confidentiality being maintained. And I got it. I promised not to say anything during the pro pro process. That's only fair. But I made it clear that afterwards, something had to be said. There, there had to be disclosure. So nothing happened for a while. There were a few delays. This, by the way, triggered a second if I could call it a disciplinary request that I made to Bishop Kenneth Carter um, um, about uh, uh, the forming of um, a panel of bishops from across the, the country to look at this. In other words, the there was a new chapter in the discipline that, that said if, if a charge against a bishop is not moving forward in a timely way, um, it's taken from only being part of the jurisdiction's responsibility, but a panel of bishops from the, across the country ha, had to, to look at this. And, and, and so um, I sent that to, to Bishop Carter, asking him to, to get involved. Anyway, um, time passed, and I'm not sure if I'm saying this well, but um, finally, almost a, a year to the day after I sent the initial charge, um, September 24th, 2019, this was BC before COVID, um, I received a letter from Bishop Hashibata saying that the Western Jurisdiction Response Team unanimously agreed to close the matter, which means nothing came of my complaint. The technical term for this was um, it was dismissed. Okay. So um, they definitely got the complaint. You did speak with Bishop Hoshibata. Uh, he wanted you uh, to swear to uh, secrecy. No, that's not the right term, but uh, confidentiality. Uh, Something like, yeah. But then um, that was conditional upon, you agreed to it on the condition that eventually some kind of public statement is made by them, and then at that point you can speak to it. Um, yeah. So, um, if necessary. 
But according to you, even though they got some of the ball rolling, it didn't go very far. And once it didn't go very far, they just notified you that the charge had been dismissed. Uh, to be clear, this was not ju a just resolution policy where they would have um, had you sign off that you were satisfied um, they did not give you any kind of um, input into what kind of conversations would take place or what kind of um, discipline would be done. They just notified you that, um, well, all they really did, I think if I understood you correctly, is they notified a few other bishops about it and kind of did a confab on if they wanted to follow up on your uh, charges, right? I think that was... Um... I, well, I'm not sure if that's saying it exactly right, but basically they, I, I didn't agree to the matter being settled. There were other people involved. Um, I, I think they were trying to keep everything confidential. Uh -huh. We had some back and forth over that. And I, I finally communicated that I would share nothing during the complaint proceedings, but afterwards it'd be fair game to talk about. And, um, Afterwards, I awaited for um, after after the letter that said it was dismissed. I waited for some sort of comment or or news release that never came out. Yeah. And so I wanted to say something, but I wasn't really sure how to say it or to whom, because I wanted to have integrity. Plus, with pastoring, dealing with COVID, and now disaffiliation, I I, I was really busy, so I yeah. wasn't sure how to share anything. Yeah, I mean, there's so many things to say at this point, and one is um, accountability for bishops has been a priority for a long time, long before this, you know, going back before Sprague, and that's been at the heart of the traditional plan and other efforts by conservatives in the denomination. Whenever we created this jurisdictional conference plan, you created these silos where um, a lot of bishops just refused to hold one another accountable. Um, that can also go in a bad direction. Right now, I'm sure you're aware Bishop um, Carcano has uh, been removed from her office. I think she's still being paid, but uh, they've refused to follow the timeline of a complaint process. So she's been indefinitely removed without any kind of judgment being uh, made as to her uh, guilt. Uh, they've kept everything um, contained in confidentiality, but it's really... Um, upset the workings of of the denomination. So we've 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 had a syst systemic problem for a long time of bishops uh not being held to the discipline well. Um uh, when you talked about having integrity, uh you entered this process knowing that it probably wouldn't go anywhere, knowing that the bishops would almost certainly not do what was clearly needing to be done by disciplinary standards. Um, the only explanation I have for that is an integrity move, where um, so often in, in, in annual conferences right now, what we're hearing is bishops saying, uh, you can't leave under paragraph 2553 because you have to have a problem with this annual conference. Is there ways in which we, we this annual conference, has not upheld the Book of Discipline? And conservatives will say, yeah, yeah, there's stuff all over the place, and they'll say, did you find a file a complaint? Did you file a charge? And then uh, most of the time it's no, no, I, I didn't. I don't want to be a person in the church who's finding for, uh, filing formal complaints against people. And then even when there has been a formal complaint, they say, "Well, we confidentially handled it behind closed doors. We defended the discipline. You just can't know about it." So that seems to be what happened here. You engaged the disciplinary process in earnest to show that it doesn't work. It is not working, or to to be proven wrong. Hey, if it does work, that's great. But you and your integrity said, okay, here's the process. I'm going to follow it. And then they did what most conservatives knew they were going to do from the get-go. They quietly dismissed it. Nobody heard anything about it. That's why you and I are talking about right now. Yeah. It's, it's, yes. uh, there are thousands of developments that happen every year. We forget certain things. This just disappeared into the ether and, okay, we got this confidential process. It's going to be handled. Well, it doesn't look like it was handled at least to someone like me. We, uh, so <laughs> I don't know. Uh, is there anything else to be said about why it was that, that when they, they dismissed these complaints that nobody heard anything about it? Um, I think desiring to keep things quiet is, is definitely a part. And I think bishops do need our compassion. Leaders do. I mean, we're pastors. We know pastors. 
can have people coming after them. It's not always healthy. This was different. It was more of uh, somebody raising a flag up and saying, I'm challenging the church. You almost, you're almost guilty if you ig ignore this. Um, so I'll, I'll say a few things. I don't believe the way the complaint was addressed was in keeping with the spirit of who we are supposed to be as United Methodists. Um, and, and so I am, um, I, I'm sharing now because I, I think on the one hand, I have to have integrity. On the other hand, to have integrity, I have a responsibility in the church. So um, let me say, I'll try to share some basics. Can you um, ask away? And I'll tell you if I, I think I can answer. Well, um, okay. So was there more than one? I mean, we already know that Bishop Carter and Bishop Hoshibata were involved. Were there other bishops that, or other people that you know were involved in the process? Yes. Okay, so more than one bishop. Yes. Um, can you name them? Do you know who they are? I, I, I was going through my notes. I know at least who some of them are, but I, I won't. I'll just say there were multiple high-ranking United Methodist leaders who um, were aware of Bishop Olivito's teaching and allowed her to continue after making those teachings. And so to some degree, it seems they were complicit with her. Yeah, complicit. That's quite a word. Um, yeah. So when they notified you that your charges were dismissed, did they engage your charge at all? Did they say that it was like without merit or that you were mistaken or any kind of evaluation of the content of your charge? Um, there was a public record of her words, and, and the final reply from Bishop Hoshibata did not question my accuracy in um, uh, repeating her words. So um, there, there, no one said I got my facts wrong. But they didn't do any kind of uh, theological review, just saying, oh, no, Bob, you, uh, you misunderstood what she was saying here, and actually uh, this is how you can interpret her words so that she does have an Orthodox Methodist uh, Christology. There was no engagement on that level. I, I would say um, I, I would say I don't know what could have happened that I was not privy to, but to my knowledge, the complaint was dismissed without any acknowledgement that her teaching was in any way wrong. So there was no remedial or disciplinary action that was taken that I'm aware of. And beyond this, I, I was encouraged to reach out to Bishop Olivito to engage in theological conversation about our differences. And although having to talk with someone who disagrees with you, particularly maybe like someone like you or me, yeah. that could be viewed as a form of punishment. I, I was clear that from the get-go, this situation about a public teaching called for a public response to create understanding about what Methodists do believe. It, it wasn't a, a Matthew 18 moment where one brother goes to another brother or a sister privately. Mm -hmm. It was something for the, the entire church to deal with. Yeah. Well, and it just makes the, the conversation hard at this point. So, well, not for, for anyone who's wanting to talk about it, I mean, and this is by design, whenever we're trying to discern is... is this ship we're on, a functional ship, it depends very much on, on um, justice. And that means uh, when something wrong happens, what is done to make it right? Is it at all addressed? And, and whenever the impression is given that people uh, can act with impunity in any office, especially the highest office, then at that point it, it becomes a question of does the body even have integrity? But you can't display that integrity if everything is behind this this steel curtain or this 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 mask of um, confidentiality. So um, it also makes it so that the only kind of conversation you and I can have about what was said, what was done, is all conjecture because by nature everything has been hidden. Yes. But before we do some of that conjecture, and I think we can do some of it responsibly, maybe. Yes. Um, it, it's important to acknowledge that even this, this confidentiality thing, is a theological issue, um, and that Methodists in particular have a heritage of accountability, and what accountability traditionally meant in the beginning was watching over one another with love, holding one another to account. It's in the general rules that people would be publicly uh, chastised for failing to obey 
the general rules, and that if they habitually and unrepentedly, uh, unrepentantly broke them, they would be dismissed from the fellowship. So public accountability is, is, is in the DNA of Methodism, but that seems to have been uh, uh, entirely dismissed. And what's instead uh, happened is a kind of um, a personnel, personal res- uh, what's it called? In, in uh, corporate environments, you have uh, human resources, an HR kind of uh, professionalizing of conflict resolution that all happens behind the scenes. And if you know anything about how HR departments work, you know they don't actually protect the people who work at the company. They protect the people at the top. And that could, uh, one who is cynically inclined like I am to look at group dynamics like that can easily see that blueprint in the United Methodist Church where they have co-opted the term accountability and turned it into its, its opposite using the same, <laughs> same word. Um, so, so we have to do some conjecture. How could they possibly, when what is written in the Book of Discipline is there, the general rules, the Bible, we have all these resources that are supposed to inform how we work out justice within the, the group that we're in. How could they possibly arrive at the position that they did, where they just dismissed it uh, without answering your theological concerns or concerns for the body? How could, they, how could this be the end? How, how, how does this happen? Well, my accounts of Karen Alavito's teachings were not challenged nor was effort made to say I'd seriously misconstrued her teachings. It also was not argued that our understandings of Jesus, our Christologies were the same, but it was said that her teachings fell within the scope of United Methodist doctrine and are in keeping with um, newer um, understandings of our historic um, doctrinal standards. Wait, wait, where was that said? Who said that? That was in the, the the letter that came out explaining, you know, why, how the how the charges how the matter was closed, how so, the charge. So they personally me. sent you a letter explaining how, and you're not sharing that letter publicly, but you're highlighting individual portions at this point that explain some of what's hidden. Yeah, I, I think it's important to know. I think I would go to jail for saying this. I would be defrocked for saying this because it's so important. It was said that her teachings. Um, these are a slight paraphrase, fell within the scope of United Methodist doctrine and are in keeping with newer understandings of our historical doctrinal standards. What what does that even mean? I don't understand this. Are they pointing you to some document that um, reflects this newer Christology? Well, here's a point that I think many United Methodists who are loyal, not all, but many who are loyal first to the institution— seem to be confused by or causing confusion with either intentionally or unintentionally i can't judge but when when those of us who are concerned about doctrinal drift raise concern this is more than doctrinal drift i mean this is a a tsunami well we are mostly not saying that the methodist articles of religion or the eub confession of faith will ever be changed or will be changed in the near future nor are most of us disagreeing that the quadrilateral is a useful way of interpreting scripture. Wesley didn't draw us a picture of a, of a, of a four-sided figure, but it's, in, it's inherent in if you read his stuff. No, what we're saying is that our, our foundational theological standards are not being treated as standards or cornerstones or guardrails, but more as museum pieces. So instead of saying, Karen Olivito's teaching is wrong because her teaching is or are not connected to the foundation, built onto the cornerstone. It, it's sort of being said, well, the articles of religion, if I understand the implication of what was in the letter well, the articles of religion are what people believed in then. But this is what we believe in now. And the connection is we're all Methodist. And, and for the record, this teaching is not only found about you know Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman and Karen Alavito's work. About a, a month ago, I was viewing a um, mandated uh, for everyone in our conference serious work about clergy sexual abuse, which is a serious matter that should concern us all. We have to deal with it. There has to be accountability there. 
And the same false teaching or an allusion to it about Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman was, was brought up there, at least in one way, at one moment. And, and so Jesus was like, the again, the Archie Bunker who needs to change if we stop and think about it. And, and so if that makes sense, it's not that our standards are changing. It's that we're denying that our standards are standards. Well, what I'm picking on is, I mean, I would, I would, I wouldn't disagree with anything you offered, except I really don't like the Wesleyan quadrilateral. I just think it causes more problems than it helps. But even so, we don't need to belabor that. It, is, it sounds to me as though there are a different set of doctrinal standards that the church in general does not have access to. Because you and I, we would file charges based on our current doctrinal standards, which are uh, you know, the Articles of Religion, the EUB uh, equivalent, um, the Wesley's, John Wesley's notes on the New Testament and standard sermons. When you look at all of those, what, what Bishop Oliveto offered was not in keeping with any of that. However, according to the bishops that corresponded with you, there is some doctrinal standards that she is in accordance with that are newer, but they are not in the corpus of our acknowledged doctrinal standards in the Book of Discipline. And that, that seems very... That, that concerns me if there are authoritative standards that, that others are being held to, or maybe I'm held to, that I don't know about. I, I don't see how that works. It seems to me that, that what they've done is ensconced. Okay, so I wasn't alive, but back when this denomination was uh, first uh, given birth to, there was a, a statement on pluralism in the Book of Discipline that uh, massively failed and that they canceled, you know, because you have to have some foundational doctrine. But it sounds to me as though even though they officially killed it, it's actually still alive and that um, they're not willing to hold anyone accountable who doesn't toe the line to our doctrinal standards in actuality. Does that sound like a conspiracy theory to you? Or how, 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 how are we making sense of this? Because it makes no sense to me. Well, I think your viewpoint is probably as good as mine. I, I think um, maybe it's other another side of the same coin. I think what happened with uh, Karen Olivito, Bishop Olivito, demonstrates for one thing that what's happening now is about far more than homosexuality or even human sexuality in a, a, a broad sense. Mm -hmm. So um, if I hear the stay UMC apologist for the UMC correctly, they're, they're saying, you know, we 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 people who are more evangelical can't claim that the UMC is theologically unorthodox on Christology because these doctrinal standards aren't staying in place. But obviously there, there's something wrong. And it turns out these standards are utterly powerless to prevent high levels of high the, the highest levels of Methodist leaders from using their appointment-funded prominence and positions to teach against the sinlessness and divinity of Jesus and to, to sort of promote a different viewpoint, mm -hmm. which, which means the de facto doctrine of UMC leadership as a whole is very different from what's in the Articles of Faith. And, and, and here's what, what came to my mind recently. Um, it used to be said, and you would get this at um, various seminars you go to, and if you're working with youth 15 years ago, um, our national religion was a therapeutic, moralistic deism. Have you heard that phrase before? Yes, I've read Kendra Creasy Dean's Almost Christian. I'm very familiar with this concept. Oh, yes. And, and if someone out there isn't familiar, our faith is therapeutic because the goal is to make us feel good. And, you know, God does want to bless us. He does give us peace. Our, our, our faith is moralistic, not meaning old time morality, but God wants you to be nice and kind to everyone. And our, our faith is deistic in that we believe there is a God, but like Benjamin Franklin's God, at least for much of his life, we believe he's far away and, and doesn't do anything. So it's therapeutic, feel good, moralistic, be nice, deism, God is there, but a long way off. And I think that still might be the outlook that many people in many places have today. But what is happening now is that the feel-good faith, which didn't have a lot of substance, is being replaced with a more radical message you alluded to earlier that is committed to advancing agendas and groups in ways that are contrary to the church and what it's always taught for 2,000 years and to the scriptures. And so as a result, when he's in the way, People are willing to throw Jesus under the bus and to torture 
stories like the account of the Syrophoenician woman to make it fit with their um, intersectionality or their desire to promote various groups. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm trying to imagine a left-leaning person watching this and just going, oh, what a bunch of fooey, you know, but it, it, um, you know, it really, I think you're right to say this is so much bigger than human sexuality, first off, that everything is connected. I I think it bears repeating what Kendra Creasy Dean said, which is that, um, MTD, moralistic therapeutic deism, is is not a Christian ideology, but it is something that invaded the church as a hostile invading force, and it co-opted the church in large segments. Um, so much of what we're doing now seems to be a willful ignorance of the possibility that there can be ideological drift within a body, or even um, co-option. Uh, that that an ideology can co-opt the church. And Jesus and our historical doctrines are guardrails against that, and so um, it makes sense that we would not enforce our doctrinal standards if there are people who are, let's use that word again, complicit in the ideological co-option of an institution that was initially built around the person and work of Christ Jesus as known through the Scriptures. So that all... word, can I give you a good word that just you brought to my mind? Yeah, Freudian concept of denial that you know there's almost a uh, a process in the mind going on in which we don't see what we don't want to see. I think something like that is going on with some people too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so when when we're talking about the bishops who are responsible for overseeing your complaint. It's clear that they just dismissed it. It's clear that there were multiple bishops who did see it and were given a responsibility of it. Um, yes, I'm aware true. that there's something called the Committee on Episcopacy. Do you know if they ever received this complaint or acted on on anything that you submitted for review? Well, it, it didn't get referred to them or to counsel for the church, to my knowledge. I, I understand um, what was supposed to... Um, that that means that um, the dismissal of my complaint had to have the consent of other leaders in the region. Um, it wasn't only the work of one bishop saying we're not going to do this, or okay, we're not yeah. going to deal with the complaint. Yeah, we yeah we already knew. Well, I guess hypothetically, from this conversation, one one bishop could have just unilaterally said we're going to dismiss it. I don't care what you guys think, but. It seems far more uh, likely that it was a collaborative effort on the part of. Uh, well, do you have a, a guess at how many bishops eventually saw this and dealt with this? You know, I, I, I would say more than one, and I'm not going to guess so that I don't violate confidentiality. Plus, when I'm guessing, uh-huh. um, I'll, I'll just say more than one, um, more than two, because I've mentioned two already, but more than two. Well, so if I was a viewer here, I would say. Um, if I was sitting at my home and, and uh, uh, judging us, I would say, well, look, uh, Bob is not bound by confidentiality anymore. They didn't uphold their end of the deal. They said they would put out a statement. They never did. So you're no longer bound by this confidentiality agreement. I'd say, well, I'm also, <sighs> yeah, but those of us who like are bound by our covenant with the church, we go the extra mile. You know, Timothy was, if Timothy could get circumcised when Paul said that wasn't necessary to go and share the faith with the Jews in Jerusalem, I can keep confidentiality a tad more than I want to. I don't know if that makes sense, but I I always believe in going the extra mile there. Well, it's so, I mean, and, and it's for you to discern. However, when it's just one guy getting cut, that's one thing. Whenever it's a whole body missing out on information that is is important to have that's a that's a whole other thing so okay, let me let me give you one thing that might help in in 2016 there was a a new paragraph added to the discipline yeah. saying yeah. if the disciplinary process took more than 180 days to complete uh, correct me if i'm saying this wrong it had to be sent to a panel of five bishops from across the USA right and so this is paragraph 413.3.2 
point D, point II. And I, I did write Bishop yeah. Kenneth Carter, uh-huh. who was at the time the Bishop of the Florida Conference and the president of the Global Council of Bishops, asking him about the appointment of that panel, which was supposed to happen. And, and I uh, never heard back from him. And I think you have a copy of the um, certified mail receipt you yeah. might want to show that yeah. shows that at least his office got it. And, and so I, I I think in terms of what happened with Bishop Olivito, I'll say this, it was dealt with within the Western jurisdiction. It was supposed to be dealt with on the uh, within the, the um, national bishops of the United Methodist Church. That didn't happen. So you can't say everyone was involved with that, but there was a broad degree of complicity that would be concerning to all of us. This was not one rogue bishop who no one could stop. There right. was a, an allowance of this teaching that many people share. Yeah, yeah. To imagine if if this was shared within the larger body of the Council of Bishops or just a larger group, you know, just a group of five, you know, um, why why are we not hearing? Why haven't we heard about any bishop standing up for uh, maintaining disciplinary standards? And then um, I, I think maybe what they would say is, you don't know that they aren't standing up. These things happen behind closed doors or confidential. We're working this stuff out privately. But um, if they are having that argument, there's only one side that's winning over and over. Would that be a a fair thing to say? I was thinking about how um, a couple decades past, a number of bishops went on record as opposing our teaching about homosexuality being incompatible with Christian teaching. Mm -hmm. They, They came out, I think there was 15 of them. One of them, I believe, was my own bishop at the time or had been. They came out and said this. Well, I haven't heard of anyone coming out and saying, no, we we really believe Jesus is who the Bible says he is. Mm-hmm. And we, we really believe this is important to affirm whether or not we want to remove a bishop or not. We just really believe that what she taught was wrong. And someone has to say that. Yeah. I, I, I haven't I haven't heard that. What to make of that is um, beyond my judgment level. Yeah, there's there's so much that we can't know, and I do feel like it's important for me to reiterate. I try and say it frequently. There's no way for me to know the inner thoughts and motivations of other people, and I'm not interested in the um, he's the the they're bad, we're good type stuff. It's just you know here we have a structure that's been given to us to maintain in, in earnest and fidelity, and um, it's hard to feel like that's happening uh, right now when looking at these particular details. Um, yeah. You know, I feel like we've covered the, the, the nuts and bolts of this pretty well, but, uh, and we've already talked a good deal of theology and, and kind of the theory behind this, but what, what else is there to be said? What, 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 what truths does this indicate that people should take in at this point in the, the life and the work of this denomination? Well, this is what I think about the um, relationship of the uh, post-separation UMC that's what who, the, who's left after the evangelical conservatives leave. Yeah. yeah. What they teach about human sexuality and their ability to remain um, functionally orthodox in what they teach about Jesus. And by the way, we're getting some power surges. You still have me on? I do. Okay, good. Well, this is what comes to my mind. The United Methodist Church defines the practice of homosexuality as being incompatible with Christian teaching. Yeah. And you can't really escape that conclusion, not only when you read the few alleged clobber verses, but when you when you read the Bible as a whole. Now, homosexuality is not the unforgivable sin or a sin that especially elicits the wrath of God. God loves homosexual persons, and Christ died for them. Mm-hmm. But the practice is still a sin. Yes. And yet, in spite of us, there's this major movement to change the understanding of what Really, you can't change within our denomination. Right. Well, I think when we define a behavior, whatever it is, as being against Christian teaching and then try to justify the behavior anyway, the almost unavoidable tendency will be to deny parts of the faith that contradict the rightness 
of that behavior. So, oh no, I, I can't say that because it goes against what I want to say. And then over time, we start to deny parts of the faith that make the faith look good. Because if your goal is to change Christian teaching so that it says something that it doesn't say, in the end, you're not going to be going to war with six clobber verses, but you're going to have a problem with the whole of Christian teaching. And that may not happen to everyone, and there can be exceptions. I mean, it may not happen to Adam Hamilton, but that will be a tendency. And I, I think you can see that playing out across the UMC. I mean, they have these spectacular overdone videos complaining about the preacher who preaches in drag as Miss Pentecost. But forget what she's wearing or he's wearing. Listen to what they're saying. This is where the alarm bells are. Would you, would you agree with that? Would I agree that the alarm bells are ringing, uh, particularly around Miss Pentecost, or particularly around the rise of a new gender theory that has? Been no, I'm saying order. more about what Miss Pentecost is saying about the Bible and about God. Those are the biggest oh. alarm bells. Yeah, Everything so else, those, these this, are the these are the bells you hear in a steeple. What's being said about God? What's being said about the Bible? The other stuff yeah, matters. Yeah, it really matters. But it's what is being said about God and Scripture and Christ. It matters more than everything else. Yeah, well, and what what I hear you saying that uh, it's all connected. Yeah. So it, you can't compartmentalize Christology from sexual ethics, from Trinitarian theology, from Hamartiology, from Soteriology. It's it's all connected. Um, and so one, whether or not we use polysyllabic words, it's right, all connected. Right. Yes, exactly. And and what what the institution is wanting to do. Um, is compartmentalize these things, say, okay, well, we can be off base here, we can have heterodoxy here, and we can still have, well, and, and the place it eventually goes is we've been trying to, to have this kind of coalescence around um, mission. Hey, we can believe all kinds of different things, but we can do mission together. But what you find is even when we do mission, well, heck, we had the fight around General Board of Church and Society when I was in high school where we understood that that our missionaries were teaching and preaching very different things from what people in the pews actually think is essential for salvation. And so there is no part of what we do together that is not tarnished by the corruption that's allowed. You know, if you want to let me bring up a familiar topic, um, and you can edit this out if you want, mm -hmm. I, I think what's going on with human sexuality has a parallel in what the Bible teaches about slavery. Would it be okay to... Um, Go down that rabbit hole. Oh, might as well. Let's talk about slavery. Okay. Um, if you read the Bible on um, the level of someone who might just take one passage like Matthew 15, 21 to 28 and think Jesus was a bigot, well, there are passages in the Bible that make slavery look acceptable. And hey, everyone was doing it. I, li I like the word. Well, it's a bad case, but ubiquitous. It was everywhere. But if you read the Bible on a high school level or higher, you, you'll notice this. The, the vision of heaven is one where everyone sits under their own vine, un, they have their own fig tree. No one makes them afraid. That does not fit with slavery. And in the Old Testament, the penalty for kidnapping, which could often go with enslaving people, was death. And in the New Testament, it doesn't look like there'll be slave traders in heaven, mm -hmm. which is a part of the reason why the overall message of the Bible, it wasn't just clobber verses about slavery, that message is why John Newton was so amazed by God's grace when God forgave a wretch like him. Mm -hmm. But what happened in the American South is very often slaves, you want to teach them something, you, they were taught a view of Christianity that accepted slavery. Mm -hmm. So slaves were taught to obey their masters, not only for the practical reason that they might not have a choice and slave rebellions often end bad and they could die, but they were taught to obey their masters because this pleased God. Mm -hmm. And then if we let slaves learn to read, um, or they had Bibles for their preachers to use, those Bibles had holes in them. I, I believe like Adam Hamilton's Bible, where he says, well, there's three buckets, and some of this was never the will of God, or, or Jefferson's Gospels that left out the miracles. The slave Bibles had holes in them too. Mm -hmm. So for some reason, the slave masters didn't want the slaves to hear about Moses Bring the Hebrew slaves. I don't know why the slave masters in the South would want that. So slave Bibles tended to not include, you know, the book of Exodus. Mm -hmm. And then finally, and this was sort of a low point, and this is not to judge any region of the country because it can happen anywhere. 
1861, Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, gave a, a famous speech called the Cornerstone Speech. Have you ever read it? Not to my knowledge. Okay, this is worth looking up. You can find it on the internet. He, he intentionally, I would say blasphemously, referred to something like what we would call white privilege mm -hmm. as being the cornerstone of the Confederacy. Great. And so okay. he didn't only say the ideal that all men were created equal in our, you know, that was wrong, but he was equating white supremacy to the cornerstone, having to have heard that Jesus is the cornerstone. And at one point, he addresses the claims of missionaries that, my goodness, the gospel is being preached in Africa. It's changing people's lives. He says, no, that's not good enough. They need to be slaves first. Okay. My point is, it's not that accepting homosexual persons is inhumane like slavery was, or that everyone in the South was bad or the North was good, goodness no. But when we consciously reject part of the light, eventually we will reject all of it. And conversely, you know, probably, you know, the debates about Abraham Lincoln's faith, you know, the, the, this guy who um, was not a member of any church, did he believe? And the longer the Civil War went on, the longer he was convinced that slavery was a, a very evil thing, and the more he um, appeared to lean on the scriptures to where some of his speeches were like little sermons that were better than what you and, and I can do. Mm -hmm. so, so my point is, what, whatever else you, you want um, you want to say, you know, this truth about human sexuality, there are debates to be had, mm -hmm. but if we deny the scriptures— we will end up denying a lot more. Yeah, so many, so many people who lean left, if they if they watch this conversation, they're gonna they're gonna respond to this point in particular, going, these guys are so tone deaf, they don't realize that these scriptures about liberty are the very ones that uh, should cause us, should compel us to question our historic stance on LGBTQ persons. Um, that when the overarching story of the Bible is one of liberty and freedom, being freed from oppression, freed from the tyr tyranny of the masses, tyranny of autocracy, we, we need to understand that LGBTQ persons have historically been marginalized, and, and, and they are now the slaves. We, we're clear about the slaves. We're clear about women. Do we not see that this naturally extends to the LGBTQ Population. You want to talk about the broad swath of the Bible? That's where it is, guys. Um, and I think that's where a lot of this conversation gets hung up. And I don't know that they listen to what we have to say after that, where we just say, "Look, categorically, we don't agree that sexual identity and preference is at all the same as race and sex." Uh, and we understand that everybody right now, the popular thing is to say that these are. Uh, inalienable characteristics that are uh, God-made, just like uh, race and, and gender. We understand that that's where everybody says the science is. We just disagree. And it's not that we say, oh, they're just perverts who've chosen this. It's that we believe that human sexuality is much more complicated than people on the left think it is. We don't think people fit into these magical boxes that, that stay the same. We think Human sexuality is, is more fluid, especially when you look historically. But also we believe that human sexuality is much simpler. You know, the Bible provides us a very simple portrait of what's acceptable sexual practice. And Christians historically have been known as very sexually restrained persons from the very beginning. And so, so we, we have a fundamental disagreement about identity how it's formed and shaped, what constitutes a God-given identity versus a world-corrupted identity. Um, and so I'm in, in agreement with you that the Scriptures um, point in a certain direction about slavery um, that is important for us to acknowledge and retrace so that we can see how God's liberty does and does not work. But we would be very—what I see in Olivito— all of Ito's uh, text that you lifted up today is this desire to boil the scriptures down to a palatable message today. So the palatable message for her is we have to use our privilege for the benefit of those who are um, historically marginalized, whoever they are, and we have to we only come closer to God whenever we shut ourselves down and and meet the agendas of 
people deemed to be victims, um, which is is pretty close to something I would actually say the Bible does say, but the devil's in the details. And I think that we we want to boil down the Bible to just a story about liberation. You know, you have liberation theology, and whatever amounts to freedom glorifies God and is what we're supposed to be doing. But it's like love. You know, freedom and love can be defined in a lot of different ways. And the freedom that we're talking about is freedom from sin, not freedom you know, from any constraint whatsoever. Sorry, go ahead. When you, no, you, you were making me think. Is, are you done? I can be. I, don't want to I can go on forever. Oh, but no, okay. please go on. I was thinking if I'm an evangelical, I believe in being born again. Right. There's a crude salvationalism that just says, accept Jesus, go to heaven. Don't worry about what happens down here. Don't care about the rights and the marginalized or the poor right. or anything else. It's just yeah. that the whole world has fallen. Just wait for heaven. Yeah. I think the, the other side of that is sort of saying what you're saying. There's a, a message in the Bible about freedom and justice and and liberty but they're crude also they're they're divorcing that from salvation yes. and where they hold together is in Jesus which is why i think bishop olivito's teaching in that particular case was contrary to the gospel because the jesus who died for us on the cross is a Jesus who announced his, his ministry in the town of Nazareth by reading that passage, Isaiah 61, about setting the oppressed free and, you know, references to basically to the year of Jubilee being that turning around. So Christ came for the broke. He came for everyone, but he came for the broken. He came to put things right. But you can't separate that from his his dying on the cross, and you can't separate that from him being the son of God. Otherwise, why not go with Karl Marx, or why not go with Dr. Phil or someone who can make us feel good if that works, or why not go with a drug or whatever? But mm -hmm. we're saying Jesus is all, and, and, and he's worth he's worth giving our entire life to. Yeah, I think that Asbury revival going on, people are feeling something I know early in my life, it doesn't mean you you feel something. You never can be tempted or struggle with anything in your life, but you feel something. You know, this is the greatest thing in the world, and I want to align myself with that. And I think that's who Christ is. Yeah. And if he's not the greatest thing in the world, he's essentially nothing. Yeah. Well, and the the place where the rubber hits the road with that is if he really is the greatest thing in the world and the purpose of our lives is to be in relationship with him and glorify him in everything that we do why do we imagine that we get to hold on to other desires you know there there are there's a cost that comes you know jesus talks about cutting off our hand or gouging out our eye um, why do we imagine that that does not extend to us sexually why do we imagine that that doesn't extend to us morally you know, there's just this fundamental unwillingness to believe that Christ could require for me to give something up that I'm very drawn to, that I love very much. And the the burden that, that people like you and I carry, well, and I no, I, I shouldn't make assumptions about you, but I, I don't struggle in the ways that some other people struggle. I have my own struggles, but I need to be willing and, and able and even eager to identify those parts of myself that, that I deeply identify with and even love, that if they, for a moment, uh, are revealed to to take glory away from my God or uh, constrain my relationship from Jesus in some sense into the fire they go, you know. And that's the kind of faith that John Wesley showed. That's the kind of faith that early Wesleyans, Methodists showed. And that's the faith that the world needs to see again, a faith that's worth sacrificing for, um, because otherwise it is moralistic therapeutic deism where God just wants us to be happy and he wants us to have the desires of our heart and he's this nice genie. And uh, the, the Bible points to a God that's much greater than that. And that's what I think, I mean, you're, you're, what you did in filing the complaint, it's an integrity move for the organization, but it also is just reminding the people at the top, like, hey, this is, <laughs> this is the biggest deal on earth. This is worth filing a charge about. This is worth me expecting you to do something about it. And that's why at this point we're talking about it publicly. Like, these are not things that are off to the side. This theology is life-giving, and without it, everybody is dead. And out of love for everybody, we're going to stand beside Jesus and say, uh, it's important what you say about him. And when people have spoken wrongly, we're going to lovingly correct and expect for bishops to, to accept and uphold that correction. So um, I don't know. I feel like we've, we've talked through this pretty good, and I was going to offer to close this in prayer, but I just got done talking a lot. So maybe 
uh, you could offer a prayer just for Bishop Olivito um, and the other bishops. And uh, I, I don't. Is it wrong to call her Bishop Olivito whenever she's she's been said by the judicial council to? Yeah, I guess it is wrong. Let's let's pray for Mrs. Olivito. Um, yeah. Let's let's pray Bishop. For, we'll pray for Bishop Olivetto in prayer that one day the term will be correct. Yeah. 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 And you you pray for whatever else you want, but um, yeah. Let's 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 pray. Hey, can I say one more thing in case anyone's listening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, C.S. Lewis had a, I think one of his spiritual biographies was Surprised by Joy. And so some people think there's a particular hatred for people with homosexuality because this is always coming up and we're not the ones bringing it up. Right. But Lewis had this experience at this boarding school where there's a lot of stuff going on between the guys that was wrong. And he, he wrote about it in a matter of fact way. And then he realized, I'm a single man at this stage. What, who writes children book, children's books? What are people going to think of me? And he explained that, you know, he believed in the biblical standards, but he didn't want to judge people for things that he hadn't struggled with. And he said, there's only two sins in the world. I've never been tempted. It's always the funny statement. Two sins I've never been tempted to, homosexuality and gambling. And by that, if you, if you, if you think that I've been tempted to all the rest, well, yes. Now, I don't know if we have time to be tempted to all the rest but yeah oh there is no temptation any of us struggle with it is that different from whatever anyone else struggles with so let's just pray now for everyone heavenly father may jesus christ be lifted up may people men and women be able to see him for who he is to be able to feel him and the presence of the holy spirit and know that he is real to understand that he died for us on the cross and that the gospel of Christ is the greatest thing and that through the infilling of the Holy Spirit, you can make us new however long it takes. And so we pray you would bless the world with the gospel. Let the revival in Asbury spread and spread. Bless particularly the United Methodist Church and the Global Methodist Church, and all the children of Wesley, Lord, not that we're special, but bless them in this dark hour. Help us to remember Jesus and to find him. And we do especially pray for, for people who struggle with homosexuality and with heterosexuality and with everything. And we do pray for our bishops and our pastors. We pray especially for those involved with this case. Speak to their hearts and give them a surpassing sense of just how real you are. And Lord, we just pray, be real to all of us, yes. that we might not be phonies, that we might not be fakes. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bob, thanks for taking the time to visit with me and to uh, update us on this process, and we will continue to pray for uh, the United Methodist Church and that we can navigate okay. these these times better. So. Uh, if anyone joined us, um, we thank you, and we hope that uh, God's will is done with respect to this, and um, blessings to you as, as you continue praying on these things with us. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Bob. All right, I'll see you later, man. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I'll see you on the world of Facebook. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs>